want you to look at it and try to imagine where that raisin come from. Try to picture the tree, maybe, the bush, then the grape, maybe the farmers, the pickers, then when they pack it, then when they brought it to the store. Try just to think about that. Now I'm going to ask you to please close your eyes. Just be comfortable. If you need to breathe in and breathe out, that's fine. You're going to put that raisin in your mouth. Do not chew. Just put it in your mouth. start tasting it. Don't chew yet. Be patient. See how the raisin is going to start transforming. Okay. Now I am going to ask you to start chewing on it. Start chewing your raisin. Take your time, taste the flavor. The movement of your tongue, the muscles in your mouth. How it's changing the shape. It's not the same raisin that I gave you a second ago. ring the bell and when you cannot hear the sound of the bell you may open your eyes wow the, the raisin tastes different but was it the same raisin that you always eat Who would like to share a little bit of the experience that they have? Yes. Well, it slowed, obviously, the whole thing down, and I was um, so aware of the, looking at it, of the grooves and sort of the divots in it, and, the, um, and then just as an artifact or an object in my mouth, it was fairly neutral. It had shape, which is not something that I experience usually when I sort of right. swallow raisins. So um, uh, uh, it was just breaking apart the sensory, mm -hmm. the, the multiple sensory experiences of eating yeah. into different observable units, I guess. How many times do we actually do this <laughs> when we're eating? Zero. <laughs> so this was just an example of how using mindfulness, even eating one raisin, would make us aware and feel that we need to slow down a bit. Thank you so much. Yes. So, um, so you do that with your class? Um, I, mean, I use mindfulness. Not exactly the eating. <laughs> we don't eat a lot in class, so. but yes, I use a lot of mindfulness. I, I do uh, mindful eating with peppermints right before my kids take an exam. You know, the peppermint activates that long-term memory and like pulls out like that information for them, and it's also just a way to get them calm because we're always tend to be really stressed right before an exam. So I have them go through the same process of like focusing on that. Um, and now we're at a point where they start asking me as soon as they get a paper, can I have my peppermint, please? And so we just go through that process and they're able to, you know, guide themselves as well. Yeah, and it's amazing how the kids actually ask for it. Once they experience, it's like, can we do this? So it's 
Absolutely. Do you go through that type of thing when you give them the peppermint for the first time? Yes. So, yeah. And then every time you're after, they just... And so sometimes, so um, depending on time, because we may, I'm, there may be times where I'm a little crunched for time, sometimes I will <coughs> give them um, a thought to like keep them through, carry them through with the peppermint, which is that, you know, I will be successful on this, or, you know, to just, you know, maybe think of a color, or to just focus on the flavor of the peppermint. So I may give them one or two things to focus on, uh, and then at other times, um, they'll walk themselves through the process, and then if there's enough time, we'll do a whole um, mindful eating uh, program for the class. I'll do a very short, two-minute mindful moment at the start of the class occasionally where we just you know vote, uh, walk through the process and I'll have them visualize something I'll also do a much longer visualization that could last up to 10 minutes and I'll walk them kind of through a journey um, but most of the time it ranges between two and five minutes so you may not um, always have as much time as five minutes to think about something but you can definitely give them like a thought or uh, feeling or in what we're about to do today a color to think about so after we go through the process I encourage you to ask any questions that you'd like related to how to go through this program in class and I just want to remind everybody I'm sure you probably already heard it numerous times with mindfulness there's no one feeling there's no right way there's no wrong way and so I want you to keep that in mind I'm not trying to guide you to a certain process with this. The whole point is just to give you a moment to be present and focused on what it is that I'm walking you through in a way to just give you an idea of where you are presently in this state. All right, so one of the things I always start with my kids is I ask them to get in mindful bodies. So I'm asking you guys to get in mindful bodies just to sit up a little bit straighter. You can keep your legs crossed or you can keep them straight and then hands on your lap. I'm going to ask that if you have, as I would say to them, any fidgets in your hands, so like a pencil or a pen, uh, to put them down if you have anything on your lap to remove it, because I just want you to focus on being in this moment. Just relax your shoulders. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Take a deep breath in. Exhale. Take a deep breath in, exhale, and take a deep breath in, and take a slow exhale. Now I want you to picture yourself in front of a large whiteboard, so large that it goes from the bottom of the floor all the way to the top of the ceiling. How does it feel to stand in front of that board? When you look at that blank canvas, is there anything that you can picture? Or does it just look like a sea of whiteness for you? Now I want you to shift your focus to your hands in front of you and I want you to make just like a cupping form in front of you with your hands. And I want you to look down at that cup and I want you to picture your favorite color. And as you picture it, I want you to see it first as the size of a pea. And now I want you to grow that color until it fills up the cup that you've made with your hands. What do you feel when you look at that color? Do you feel happy? Do you feel excited? Do you feel calm? Do you feel jubilant? Do you feel hungry? Do you feel inspired? Now I want you to take this cup full of color 
and I want you to splash it onto that whiteboard. And now with your hands, I want you to just smear that color all across that whiteboard. I want you to take the leftover color that's on your hands and I want you to lick it off your fingers. <coughs> Don't miss a drop. And as you finish licking the color off of your fingers, I want you to take a nice big swallow. I want you to see if you can feel that color traveling down your esophagus and throat, down into your stomach. And I want you to take both hands and I want you to rest them on your stomach. And that feeling that your color made you feel, I want you to see if you can feel it as your hands are pressed on your stomach. I want you to take a moment Move your hands down to your side. Take a last look at your colored whiteboard. Take a deep breath in. Exhale. Take another deep breath in. Exhale. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. <coughs> Would anybody like to share what color they picture? Blue. In blue, what color blue? Uh, medium blue, fairly strong blue. Okay, all right. And what feeling did you have attached to that? Yeah, I was trying to identify that. Um, uh, I guess just alive. Does anybody know why I had you look at the whiteboard first without the color and then look at it again with the color? So you would start with the quick slate? Okay, so starting with, was that what you were gonna say, starting with a clean slate? <laughs> starting with a clean slate. So then why did I have you color the whiteboard? <clears throat> Transfer the feeling. Okay, does anybody know why I had you lick the color off of your hands? So that you can visualize it um, inside. Okay, all right, so was it about actually eating the color or was it trying to take the feeling with you? Okay. And then does anybody know why I had you put your hands on your stomach after you licked the color and you swallowed it? So sometimes um, we need um, cues or like memory uh, triggers to help remind us. And so throughout the day, you know, taking five or 10 or even 20 minutes for mindfulness or for meditation is really difficult. But one of the things that you can do is if you start with a visualization activity and you um, kind of fuse in either a thought or a color or a trigger, then throughout the day when you start to get either the opposite of whatever that feeling is, so if you start to get down and your color energizes you, you can just put your hands on your stomach as a way to reactivate that memory from the visualization. Or if you're not really feeling so alive, you're starting to feel kind of dull, you got that three o'clock slump, you just put your hands on your stomach, you remember that feeling that you had with the color of being alive. So, I mean, so it's giving you a, um, 
a body memory. Yes. Right? I mean, it's giving you a physicalization of that, like, thing. So that cues you into touch or something. Like yep. Why did I have you guys start with a small pea sized version of the color and then grow it in your hand before you splashed it? I think it's more manageable, especially if you're doing this with kids, right? So that's that's a something that you can easily grab onto and kind of try to swallow, no pun intended. Um, and you know, and then grow from there, um, rather than something that could be a little more intimidating, especially you know, as you first start doing something. Like so that. it's that's more with yourself. I mean, it's it's you. You've created it, and you can hold it, and it's more. You know, it feels like it's um, it's your thing, and then you can make it grow and so you get control of it. And then also, whenever we, uh, whenever we in enter mindful moments, we're not always feeling very mindful. We may have 10 million other things that are going on around us, and to kind of quiet your mind, quiet your body, and to get focused, sometimes really just needs to start at a pea-sized level, and then taking a moment to just center and focus on that. Any other questions? Yes. What about if you get resistance? from some students, like, I don't have a favorite color. I don't want to, I don't, I'm not, I can't pick a color. I mean, I, I just wonder. So then you can just always say to pick a color, and one of the things that you can do is you can kind of cue them with different types of colors. Are you picturing cobalt blue? Are you picturing um, platinum silver? You know, to kind of just get their creative juices, because not everybody is going to be uh, a visualizer or someone that has, like, fortunately or unfortunately, I do, the movies going on in their head all day. Um, so they may need different triggers to it. And I have had students where going through the mindfulness process, very resistant, or they would get very angry right after we had done um, either mindful listening or mindful eating or mindful movement. And the only thing that I said to them was just that it's a process and there's no right or wrong feeling. Your color that you picture may make you feel very solemn or subdued or down, and that's okay too. There's no right or wrong feeling that exists in the world. All feelings have a purpose. All colors have a purpose. So it's just about getting them to participate in the exercises and to go through them and to just be open to doing another exercise, not necessarily forcing them to feel any one way about them. Is the visualization of something um, easier than, say, um, like an, an, old, an old factory, you know, um, a smell? Um, I think it would just depend on the kid, mm -hmm. and I think it would also depend on you, mm -hmm. especially as you're getting started with mindfulness, finding what fits best with you because I think it's the authenticity. We know that kids can smell it from a mile away. So if you're if you're not feeling a certain kind of way about the mindfulness lesson or activity, I would say don't do it or don't feel like you have to be forced into it. Um, I started teaching a math class today on algebraic expressions and key terms and my kids were jumping off the wall because they were very resistant to it. So we stopped and we just did mindful breathing and mindful listening for a few moments. And you know, once I did that, they were able to be centered and present and we were able to start our lesson. That doesn't mean that their anxiety went away or that everybody was super excited about the lesson afterwards. It just means that they were present in that moment and were able to refocus. I just had a practical question. What was it that you teach? I teach uh, sixth grade, and so at McLean, that includes math, English, literature, history, and then a homeroom period. And so, so you don't have, so I was wondering how long your period was, but you teach them throughout the day. I teach them throughout the day. My periods are 40 minutes, but we also rotate based on ability, so I do not have the same kids every day. Okay, yeah. but it's 40 minutes, and you would do this at the beginning of the 40 minutes. You can do it at the beginning. You can do it in the middle. You can do it at the end. And do you rotate where you do it, or do you always do it at, at the beginning? No, I, I rotate it as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and there there's sometimes where I'll find that we need to do a transition before we exit out of the class, or midway through because we're transitioning activities, and I would like to kind of refocus them. 
Do you use the same visual walkthrough every time, or do you? No, and I, I don't work with a script with that, so it, it, it um, kind of just knowing my kids, or if I've got a kind of a feeling or a thought or a picture in my head, then I tend to kind of just want to share it with them. Um, but, um, and, and in two, just knowing if there's like a, a mood that I kind of want to guide them through mm -hmm. as well. Like, I, I definitely don't want them picturing fireworks if I need them to be very serious and, and calm before we get into the lesson, yeah. Do you ever repeat them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Especially the color one, um, because it's very open-ended, you know? Some kids may picture something that is very peaceful, and others may picture, you know, neon orange, and they enjoy being energized, so it's one of those open-ended ones, and I also do... Um, scenery you know and the best thing about visualization is no two people are going to have the exact same picture you know we may both uh, picture pine trees but our idea in our mind of what a pine tree looks like is so vastly different so it gives them a lot of ownership of it as well um, I wonder if you could speak to the before in your classroom when you did not uh, have this resource and the after and um, in so doing, also just address if you came to mindfulness through the school's um, commitment to the journey or if you came to it earlier or on your own. Yeah, okay. um, so when I first started at McLean, uh, 40 minutes is, is not a lot of time for, for a class and a transition classes. And I, I was doing a moment of silence at the beginning of my class as a way to transition my kids, but it had no meat, had no weight to it. It was, you know, and so my kids would kind of be staring off into space, or they'd be watching the timer go down, or they'd be looking at their hands, or they'd be silently making gestures at each other. So it really wasn't serving the purpose that I wanted it to, which was to get them present and focused uh, for the lesson. And so in talking to a parent that came, we do, um, uh, a guest parent speaker series where parents come in and they speak about their careers and and things that they're interested in with the class I had one of my homeroom parents come in and she started speaking about how she got into mindfulness from um, a career background in uh, just a standard medicine and uh, that parent was uh, Dr. Luisa Alvidu. And so as she started speaking, I said, hey, you know what? This sounds amazing. I meditate at home anyway, but this sounds manageable for my classroom. And so we started working together about how we could transform the first two to five minutes of my class into something that had some meat to it so that my kids weren't just staring, staring off into space, excuse me. And then from that, it just kind of caught fire throughout the school where more classes started um, picking it up and more teachers started picking it up until it became just a, a big movement throughout the school. And, and it's taught very differently from class to class because again there needs to be that authenticity and that ownership with it um, and in terms of rollout whether it happens at the beginning, the middle, or the end of class. Um, and if it happens with the same kids each way, if you're just doing mindful eating or mindful listening, if you're doing mindful breathing or mindful movement. Uh, and so that's the beauty of mindfulness is that it really is um, something that you can take ownership in and then it also becomes a collaborative effort because we've had kids lead lessons. In my class, I've had kids do mindful moments where they ring the singing bowl. They're the ones that lead kids through either visualization or just breathing. So it's kind of moved from that. Um, so you said it varies depending on the class and the teacher and, and, um, and what you do with the kids. Is there anything that as a school that everybody does consistently, whether at a specific time or a specific activity or? In the middle school, we do at the <coughs> beginning of the day. So at first period, we all try to take um, the first two minutes to have a mindful moment across the middle school. Yeah. Yeah, my, um, Mike Saxanian has actually asked teachers, this is really um, started um, when he came to the board a year or two ago, he asked teachers just take one moment, even if you're not trained or anything like that, they wanted, he wanted everyone to start, in fact we had a, we 
hand it over to the loudspeaker when we first start <coughs> to get the ball rolling. So we ask each teacher to, at the beginning of the day at least, um, before they have a homeroom or advisory, to just do that moment at the beginning. And then we, whatever happens after, throughout the day through whatever teachers are comfortable with in the classrooms. Um, then, you know, as, as Heavenly said, and I think I said too earlier when you were here, it it's, depends on the dynamics and the chemistry of your group. So wherever direction you want to take it. So, And the other thing I would encourage is uh, when you do this the first time, even the first few times, or maybe you've done it for an entire year, and then you'll roll the dice and you'll do this lesson, there is always room for pushback from kids. I did a mindful eating lesson with my homeroom and they were bouncing off the walls and talking the entire time. And there was a moment where I was like, I'm gonna quit. I'm going to quit this lesson right in the middle of it. I was being observed by our learning specialist. I was like, great, this is fabulous. Uh, and, I, and I kept going. And once it was over, I started asking the kids questions and they got it and they were present and they, explain they said you know what I was bouncing off the wall when this first started but now you know I feel a lot calmer I feel cooler I feel more centered so don't ever as I said before that there's no right or wrong way no right or wrong feeling don't get discouraged by your perception of your kids reaction to it or how they interpret it walk them through the lesson talk them through it afterwards have them talk to you um, I promise you'll see the shift I jump in just a second. I'm Heather Carvel. I speak and I teach in the upper school. I'm going to speak to you in just a minute. But in this idea of um, what do we do consistently? So I've been here at McLean for about 16 years, and I was at a school previous, and I've always taught meditation because I, I teach literature. But I did it kind of more academically, and I wanted them to kind of experience something a character might have been experiencing. And I think what really shifted in terms of the school's commitment to mindfulness was the language that we use. Now we have a consistent language, Is that so you got it. Um, and that has made all of the difference. And sometimes I'll, I'll sub in the middle school classroom, and I can still say, well, in the middle school, after school, and I can say, okay, let's try the mindful body. I mean, I teach literature, but I was working with math with a student after school, and he was, again, bouncing off the walls, resistant to math, and I said, can we do a mindful body? And he said, oh, you know, that doesn't work for me. And I said, I ah, just humor me, you know. Uh, and he actually got in the pose, and we were able to get through his little after-school um, homework. And it was just amazing that I could take that just that language is what kept it so consistent. And now when I teach meditation on a more academic level, it's just, it resonates so much more with the students. So I've been trying it kind of in isolation on my own for a long time, but it wasn't as effective as what's going on now. I just want to say that it is really amazing to me that the kids actually ask for it. I mean, at the beginning you might find a little <coughs> resistance, but then I have kids that come and say, Ms. Kerr, are we going to do our mindfulness today? Yes, we are. Okay. I mean, they're ready for it, and they ask for it because sometimes we don't have one minute during the whole day to just rest and relax and just be quiet. So they really enjoy it. So what? And that's sometimes the, the trick when you have a, a student who's not engaged in it. What I'll say sometimes is, I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm not asking you to do a math problem. I'm not asking you to write a report. I'm just asking you to sit and be quiet. And that's sometimes, oh, okay, I don't have to do anything. That sounds good. So even if you kind of get the hook, hook them that way, um, they'll eventually buy into it. But there's, as Heavenly said, you know, you're going to have your good days and bad days. It's not going to work every time. Um, but you just have to keep at it, and eventually, I think you'll get, you know, uh, you'll get that that good feedback and good response from them. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question. Do you ever play music while you're doing these? Yeah. Um, which is uh, which is a big part of mindful listening as well. Um, I actually did a, a mindful listening lesson where I had them listen just in silence to the buzzing of a room had them listen to music that didn't have words to it and then I had them also just listen to the singing bowl and then we broke down uh, how could this be useful as a takeaway so then how can I adopt this form of mindful listening um, outside of the classroom because a big part of this is really getting them to be self-advocates and to take ownership of this and to make it authentic for themselves and so the reason why I did the three part was so that they could see for some of them 
like if I don't have access to my Beats and my phone or my iPod, then I may just only have the, the buzzing of the room to focus on. Or for other students, it may be, well, I need music and, and it helps to kind of create like a white noise or a balance for me. And then for others, it could just be really honing in to the singing bowl and the different levels in the sound of that and, and, and being able to concentrate on that. So it gave them an opportunity to begin to say, this type of mindful listening works best for me or this doesn't, and so what they can adopt moving forward. Yeah, I introduced music to that group I was speaking of earlier just last week um, and I'm because I'm trying to take them s step by step through the different you know the senses and as we talked um, earlier how important <coughs> that is and it really was not a nice just a nice few minutes and they really enjoyed it it was just meditation just quiet music it wasn't anything you know you don't want to get them all riled up with some kind of yeah. rock thing but again it's it's they have to you know it's something different oh we're listening to music oh brother but then once they got into the activity, they closed their eyes, they were like, I could see they were just really kind of soothed by it and calmed again, incorporating the breathing into it as they listen. And so these are all things that are easy, easy things, very simple, simple um, things you can do that doesn't require a lot of materials or, or um, you know, things you need to bring from outside the classroom, really. So, okay, great. Emily, thank you. It's great. Does, does everyone have a singing bowl? Every well, um, not everyone does. Um, uh, thanks to Dr. Alvazu, who happens to be here with us today, Lisa. She um, has introduced mindfulness to us. Uh, she was able to um, it, donate some bowls to the teachers. And last year, when we had the, um, the workshop, we ordered, uh, we bought a lot of bowls. We, we sold them for people who were interested, and then we did uh, donate some to the teachers. But you don't need a singing bowl, you need an app on your phone. It's as simple as that. So there's lots of routes you can go with this. Um, the kids like the bowl, I have to say. You know, they like having it and they like hitting it. And, and you know, and as Heavenly also said, sometimes the, the student will conduct the lesson. You know, if, if you've gotten that far along in your practice and they're that familiar with it, they can conduct the lesson too. So um, they're, um, well, someone's going to win one today, so they can take one home today. So they're around, you can get them on Amazon. They're 30 35 out. Um, there's also diff the different sizes. Louisa has a really big one over there that she uses. And she used to teach the kids. So, anyway, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Heather Carvel. She sort of introduced um, herself already. So. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. Yeah. I also have um, my own singing bowl that I cannot say I got into bed years ago. It was seriously, I think it was World Market. So <laughs> these you can, they're around. They're around. I, um, I'm used to my tone, so that's why I brought my own. So I'm glad Heavenly did that as well. So I'm going to talk to you actually about emotions. Just the simple little things um, that kind of rule our lives. And part of what I've kind of come through with mindfulness is realizing that emotion doesn't actually have to rule our lives. So has anyone felt kind of knocked out by an emotion before? And if you can sort of picture those old punching bags with the sand bottom, like the bozo, and you punch it down and it pops back up, a lot of times what happens with us emotionally is it, we knock down and we don't bounce back up. Um, I used to perseverate a lot. I don't know if that happens for any of you where you just, something is said, something is, you didn't do something you wanted to do, you missed an opportunity, you have regret, you have irritation, you have anxiety, and it's just, is it there constantly, constantly, constantly. So part of what mindfulness is, the goal, is to bring awareness to all of that. And again, it's nothing is right or wrong, I can't say that enough. It's just about bringing awareness to these crazy things um, that beep up around our heads. So that when we feel knocked down, or when we have an incredibly intense experience, an intense parent meeting, or an, an unexpected situation with a student, or just not a great lesson that we bounce back faster. So um, what I'm going to ask is to, we're going to practice a little, uh, do a little lesson with emotions. But first, I want to kind of give you a little of framework in your folders. There's a yeah, quote. Yeah, the, the green sheet. OK. The quote, uh, so there's a, a green sheet in your folders. And this is by a man named Viktor Frankl, who wrote a little book called Man's Search for Meaning. 
just a little ditty that you did. <laughs> and um, I find this quote so completely transformative, and I'll say it over in my head a lot, and even in the moment of one of these kind of powerful emotional moments, um, I also have children at home, so there's a few of them, and um, I, I will say this quote to myself. So he said, um, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response. And that is so overwhelmingly powerful when you think about, because of course we think there's a response, we react. Teenagers who I have the um, pleasure to work with every day, you know, for them, as I'll quote a teacher from Mindful Schools, he says, he stepped on my foot, I clocked him. That's, that, was a, that was one situation. There was no, he stepped on my foot, I thought about it, there was a space, there was a response, and then I had an emotion. He stepped on my foot, I clocked him. And that is the teenage response. So I spend a lot of time with our teenagers on this quote. And actually, so they all have it now, and well, not all, but many of them have it on their Google Docs now because they're so used to me talking about this. Um, that space is where we can transform a lot of our emotional responses and our emotional relationships. Um, but it's that response that you have to become aware of, and so that's what we're going to practice a little bit today. So I'm going to ask um, us to get in a mindful pose. You can get your mindful bodies on. I'm a big two feet on the floor, but again, it, it is completely up to your own comfort level. I just like the grounding on the floor. But you know, the only thing I ask for my teenagers is that their spine is straight. And we spend a lot of time on the physiology of why I ask that spine to be straight. So they're pretty used to that one. Um, so we want to cultivate our ability to figure out where do we feel emotions in the body. And a parent asked me, well, why is that useful? So I happen to know, before I speak in front of people, I often get cold. And I learned that years and years and years ago, which was really useful as a teacher, to understand why it was always cold first period. Because <laughs> I, and, and I've just learned that about myself. For whatever reason, that's just my response. And so that's my little anxiety response, or whatever it is. So. Um, when I was talking to this parent, I said, when your child forgets his homework on the kitchen table and it irritates you to no end, sit with that irritation, form your response to it, rather than just going off the handle at him again because he forgot the homework again, that he worked so hard and he did, and yet he couldn't get it in his backpack to get it to school. So um, she and I have talked quite a bit about how does she respond to her teenager who doesn't behave the way he's <laughs> supposed to behave in her mind. And of course, we want to model what we want our students to see. So us being aware of where we feel our emotions is incredibly powerful. So um, I'm just going to uh, ring the singing bowl. I'm going to have you just breathe for a moment. Just stop listening to people. And then um, after about a minute, I'm going to say a series of emotions. And all I'm going to ask is where do you see, feel those emotions in your body? I just want you to be aware of where do you feel these emotions in your body. And often when I've done this with um, teachers and parents and students, the results are really surprising where we feel certain emotions. So I'm going to stop talking and bring our bowl. Close your eyes and just be with your breath for a moment. bit of awareness to any emotions you think you're feeling right now. And 
going to ask you to determine where do you feel the emotion when I say the word? Where do you feel love in your body? Where do you feel joy in your body? Where do you feel anxiety? Where do you feel fear? Where in your body do you feel relief? Where do you feel anger? <coughs> Where do you feel curiosity? Where do you feel patience in your body? I'm going to ask that you return to your breathing and focus in on your breathing. to ring the singing bowl again and then if you can't hear it any longer you can open your eyes when you're comfortable. rather quickly through some of those, um, but would anybody like to share your responses, your experience, anything that surprised you? I was definitely struggling with finding a place for most of the emotions, and it's just that that thought was flitting through my head when you said anxiety, it was like my shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> like it was, and, it, and that was, it was sort of, it was sort of like, wow, I felt that. So <laughs> I was, I mean, it was an exercise in, that just being able to feel that because I was like, you know, huh, right. I'm not doing anything. Right. And then right. I did that, and then you said anxiety, and I was like, oh. I know exactly where I'm feeling. Right. Coming, so. Now, I was going a little quickly, so at home, if you practice this, um, you really can just focus in on one emotion, three emotions at a time. And 
It is amazing though, when you actually feel it in your gut, in your face, in your shoulders. Did anybody else want to share? Yes. I think I felt um, almost everything in the same place that, um, you know, I felt them before when you right. things like this. And then you said patience, and I don't think I've ever mindfully thought about that. And all of a sudden it was in my arms. Um, and I wonder if that's, you know, a lot of, as, as a teacher, right, a lot of some, yes. you know, the way that we communicate kind of patience and affection is, you know, is, you know kind right. of back rub. Right, like right. So it's interesting for me actually to feel familiar with feeling where mm -hmm. I'm feeling different things and then have something right. kind of catch me. You know, I was having kind of the opposite. Oh, you, yeah, this is familiar. Oh, right. yep, I expected it right. there too. And then kind of, oh. So um, I toyed with patience a lot as I was thinking about how I wanted to frame today because I was <laughs> getting... Um, maybe too analytical about it. I was thinking, is patience really an emotion? And but I wanted to play with <laughs> yeah. it. And what, where do we feel patience? Because we need we need vast reserves of patience in our profession. <laughs> so I was trying to play with where do we feel it, so that maybe we can recognize when we're not feeling it, and when we have that moment where we need to say to the student, "Can you give me a minute?" Because I very well might not give you a response that is appropriate. Yes, what you said brought up. I had the same problem, and it immediately showed me how hard it is to keep judgment out of this. Because uh, when I couldn't find no joy or love in my life, and then because of anxiety, I'm like, okay, I know what that is. But what? I was judging. Oh, that's fantastic. So I actually started with some of the more negative emotions, and I thought, well, I don't want to start this with fear and anxiety. So that's where I pushed love towards the front. But I thought about that as well. I'm sorry. But I did think about that because I was thinking, where, where do we feel it? Also, I've done this exercise before, and I love it. Um, and um, what, what I found interesting after practicing this the first time um, when I did a, a class last summer is that now, before I notice that I'm anxious, I'll notice my shoulder going like that. I'll think, oh my gosh, I must be anxious. And if I bring attention to that, then it helps kind of knock down the anxiety before it has a chance to rise up fully. Exactly. The, the physical reaction often comes first to my attention. I, I absolutely have that same experience and that idea of just bringing awareness to it is almost, it's just, it melts it away, yeah. off, you know, depending on the severity, right. but often it just melts it away. Do you use this exercise at a time like before an exam when you are expecting that most of the kids are anxious, to have them be very aware of it and then mm -hmm like just observe it and let it go. In other words, mm -hmm. I understand what you were doing here, but right. would you ever, would you ever do it specifically when, yes. when kids are experiencing Absolutely. a strong emotion? That is exactly, exactly how I would use it. And, and I don't give a lot of assessments. Um, I mean, anxiety ridden kind, you know, they do a lot of projects and they have space. Um, but so I don't do the sit down and take a test <coughs> assessments. Um, but even before presentations, I mean, we're playing, we were playing a game yesterday and it was getting just a little too competitive and I, I said we're gonna stop and you know where are we feeling the competitiveness because this is supposed to be fun this isn't supposed to be you know who's getting all these points and um, because it was getting a little tense because of the competitiveness um, and so we just that's exactly what I said I said where are we feeling competitive and of course I was seeing a student you know hunching <laughs> up and that's actually where I was like okay <laughs> we need to bring this down a little it was it just wasn't fun anymore for a, a few moments there um, so, and that took 30 seconds, but because they're also used to me doing it. And, and you had asked the question earlier about um, times, and I wondered if you were more upper school. And so we, oh no, so we have um, 50 minutes in our classes. And again, there's just not enough time to fit everything in that we want to fit in. But if you kind of commit to it for a couple weeks, then you can have those 30 seconds where we say, okay, where are you feeling the competitiveness? Let's bring some breath to that and move on and get back to our center of this is supposed to be a fun learning thing. Hello. Um, I wanted just to add three things. Now, one is that um, it's totally um, normal that at the beginning for us it's very difficult to yes. focus any emotion in our body because we are not in contact with our body and that's mm -hmm. what's happening with our students. You know, it's very hard for them to see why am I feeling this? Because they are all over, and we are usually all over. So that was one thing, and 
just be patient because with the practice, what you're building is new neural paths that get you in touch with that body. The second thing that I wanted to add is that bringing the awareness to the students of the neuroscience behind this, what it makes them is to see and take away that uh, the thought that this is a um, Buddhist or a religious practice mm -hmm. and it's something more scientific, uh, scientifically based. Yeah. So where do you feel that tension? Well, you know that we have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic mm -hmm. response. <coughs> So when we are <coughs> tense, you know, what happens with our muscles? We're just ready to fight or flight or just to respond or have a bad reaction. So we feel in our muscles. And, uh, and what happens also in the neuroscience behind all of this is that why it is that we usually feel our emotions in our abdomen? And um, there's an amazing book that I love. It's called The Second Brain. And it talks about the neuroscience behind what has what has lately been found about neurons that the second part of our body where we have the most amount of neurons is in our gastrointestinal tract. So before we are conscious of something that we are feeling, that we're reacting to it, our gastrointestinal tract, it's already feeling it. So when you explain that to the students, they, oh, so why do I feel that before presenting a test? And they are not aware that they're anxious. And they already know the neuroscience or the physiological response behind it. What happens, is, oh yeah, I remember that my teacher told me this. So let me breathe because this is probably <coughs> anxiety. So let me breathe in and out and just think about the words because labeling the feeling or the emotion, what happens is that you just turn off the hijack of the amygdala, which mm -hmm. I think that this Anglicane explained, and you allow that part of your brain that's related with the insula, the hippocampus, to respond. So the parasympathetic system starts kicking in, and that's why the long, deep breaths are so important. Just to add something, sorry. No, it's fantastic, thank, thank you. Will you repeat that, that sentence that the, the <coughs> largest collection of in the, yes. the second part of our brain where we have the most amount of neurons is in our gastrointestinal tract. So probably it happens to most of some, some of you, but when you are very worried and anxious, you probably have difficulty to go to the bathroom. You have the second cause of uh, teachers' complaints, and uh, it's a workshop that I gave to some teachers two weeks ago. It was, um, uh, they, the second thing that they have in their purse is antiacids. Mm -hmm. And oh no, it's because I didn't have time to, to, to eat, or oh no, because I drank too much coffee, or, and then, that's anxiety. That's burnout. So it will be interesting. It's called the second brain. I just don't remember the name of the, the author, but um, it will be a very interesting source to see. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? The whole mind body uh, mm -hmm. talk brings up a question I've had all morning, and that is that in, in all the discussion about the breathing, the only adjective that's been used is deep and slow, mm -hmm. and yet there's a big difference between mm -hmm. breathing through your chest, which we often do, and it stops here as opposed to abdominal breathing, right. which is right. biologically the way that we're meant to breathe. And little kids all breathe through their bellies, right. but as soon as you get to an age where you care about what you look like, we're all going, like, yeah. sucking it up, yeah. and we breathe from here up. And I've noticed in these exercises that when we first started, there's a little awkwardness. It was all up here, and the second I let it go uh, down and do abdominal breathing, where your belly actually goes out, right, right, it changes. Right the whole way you feel. Do you ever talk about how the students are breathing? So I do. Um, I can't think specifically um, of the class this year, but I remember asking the girls in particular to put their hands on their belly buttons. And you know, and I, was, I remember saying, your, everybody's eyes are closed. Right. So um, it, is, it is, you're exactly right. And I had kind of frankly forgotten about that, but um, I remember at the beginning of the year, because one girl in particular, incredibly resistant, I heard the question earlier about resistance, incredibly resistant, because she did it last year and it was just stupid, and why would you have to do this, and this doesn't help me, and I have anxiety and it doesn't help, and it's just stupid. Um, so, you know, she's still pretty resistant, but at least she'll 
try it. And now the other students have started to say, well, maybe if you had a little more of an open mind about it, um, which is uh, which has really been that just that conversation just happened on Friday about the other students saying to her, have more of an open mind. I was really struck by that. I was really surprised because I thought maybe they were kind of agreeing with her or they were. You know, I just didn't know that dynamic, but I remember with her in particular just asking her to try to breathe through the belly. It's just so habitual mm -hmm. that if you actually don't point it out to them, you really kind of right. where they're even doing it. A lot of us do it. Right, that's Especially a great point. Especially when we're feeling anxious. Exactly. I'm a biology teacher, and when we go through the respiratory system and the diaphragm, I right. have them all, right. mm -hmm. and we like go through <coughs> the inhale versus the exhale and how we all really kind of reverse. Exactly. Breathe. So right. it's interesting that you can really tie it to the biology right. that if That's you really fantastic. think about how breathing is supposed to work, yeah. that you should yeah. breathe from your belly, but we right. really all do it reverse. We're so I've done, right? yeah, no, I've done the exercise with my kids when we're learning about <coughs> yeah. the inhale and the exhale, and they're looking at the diagram. They're like, "That's not how I do it." I'm like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. That's exactly right. No, that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Yeah, absolutely. One, two more little things. I know you want to go. Speaking of reading, I'm going to show you just a, a less than a two-minute little clip of a little uh, some some younger students, and you're going to see how cute it is the way they do their breathing. And then we'll draw from a raffle ticket, and then we'll send you on your way. Although we'll be hanging around if you want to talk to us a few minutes after. We're happy to uh, to talk to you. And remember, we will email you all this information today. We have all your email addresses, and feel free to contact us at any time. And I really appreciate your coming. It's been great. We learn, we learn a lot, too, when we do these things, all the sharing we had today. I think we learn from each other as well as from those of us who um, are presented today. So, Okay, so let's go on with this. Pretty cute, I think. Two, three. In the mind up curriculum, there is what's called the core practice. And in the core practice, three times a day, we do a breathing exercise with the kids. This was maybe the lesson that the teachers were the most anxious about, but now that we've been doing it, I think the teachers have found that it's one of the best parts of the curriculum. <coughs> I think it's awesome just because the kids are getting ready for the day, getting ready for what they're going to learn, so they have to have their brain relaxed. I've even found myself a couple of times saying, okay, I need to bring the energy level down mm -hmm. because we're moving from, say, math to science or science to writing or something, and they're all like, you know, um, even when it's not a scheduled time to breathe, I'll go, okay, then let me sit down, let's mm -hmm. breathe. Okay, guys. Focus on your breathing. What happens is you can start extending the time between the two chimes. And so the breathing breaks can get a little bit longer. You can just, you can just close your eyes and breathe. <laughs> And that's all there is to it. <laughs> I just thought that was a nice way to end things today.